Tackle the Pod, presented by Invesco QQQ, the official ETF of the NCAA. The big game this week is clearly Tennessee visiting Georgia. And we got reason to talk about both teams. It is the, uh, we'll see what the playoff committee ranks these guys, but uh, it is a significant game for both teams. And I want to start with Georgia before we get to the Tennessee part. Georgia has two losses on the year. Uh, they are seven and two with three games left. And they lost uh, 41 34 to Alabama, a game they kind of had to win. They had beat, and then they got, they got punked last week out at Ole Miss 28 10. They still have two nice wins one against Texas, one against Clemson. But here we go. Tennessee visiting Athens on Saturday night. And this feels like a, a reckoning game one way or the other for the dogs. To come into the season preseason number one and finish with three losses at least. And I'm they still have Georgia Tech at the end of the year, too, which may be a little more, it's a little spicier than uh, maybe we thought. But to finish, to have three losses and potentially not make a 12 team playoff, I think they would probably be out because of the log jam in the SEC. That said, they still have that Clemson T and Texas victories that other teams may not. But the idea that you could be out and Tennessee could defeat you there, the offense has not looked good. And Tennessee's defense has looked very good. It is the strength of that team. Ole Miss won with defense. Tennessee can win with defense, albeit different scenarios, one's on the road at home. Uh, Pat, what's up with the dogs? How much of a, of a gut check is this one after the very disappointing result in Oxford? Yeah, it's a significant gut check, I think, for the whole aura of Kirby Smart's dominance and the appearance that he had locked in his program on autopilot the way Saban had, and they were just going to be there forever and never take steps back, and they're on the verge of taking a step back. Schedule's been incredibly hard. If they have two losses, they're absolutely getting in. I think if they can get there with 10 and 2, uh, they can. they are getting into the playoff. Even they might be the first team in with three losses if it gets to that point. But you don't want to lose this one and put yourself in that position, that's for sure. And this has just not looked at all, Dan, like a like a Georgia team that is just, you know, they were so physically dominant. 2021, 2022, and even before that, in the years before that when they were good, they were a, they were a team that would beat you up physically, and their running game is horrible. Absolutely terrible. They are last tied for last in the SEC in 20-yard runs with seven. We're also tied for 106th nationally in that. They had a long run of 12 yards against Ole Miss, a long run of 12 against Alabama, a long run of 17 against Kentucky, and a long run of 18 against Texas. Your kids' sparklers are more explosive than Georgia's running game. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing there. It's just bizarre to see. So uh, they're just they're, they have an identity crisis at the moment. We'll see if they can get over it enough. Because you said the Tennessee defense presents a real challenge. I don't think they can magically wave a wand and come up with a running game in time for that. So I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, we'll see about the health of Tennessee quarterback Nico Iamaliva. But for now, just looking at the Georgia side of it, this is a a desperate situation. Well, and not only do they, you know, struggle running the ball, Pat, but you look at the. Uh, the quarterback position in, in Carson Beck, I think nine interceptions in the last four games. Um, and, and some of those, you know, pretty, pretty bad. It, it, that's uh, not only can they not run the ball consistently, but, but they're having trouble in turning the ball over through the air um, as well. And, and when you're facing a defense like Tennessee, that that's not a good place to be. So there's just not a lot of confidence right now. It feels like uh, in Georgia's offense overall, um, and like I said, been turning the ball over, not great. 
But as Dan mentioned, you know, they st- probably have t- two of the best wins, right, of anybody in the country. Probably the two best wins uh, of anybody in the country, beating uh, beating Clemson and beating um, beating winning at Texas as far as two wins on the same schedule. Uh, so if they win, you know, win out and they're 10 and 2 or – or eleven and two, or ten and three, depending on the cha- SEC championship game. If they get in, or win, or lose, they probably are in. I still think, in a lot of ways, they control their own their own fate um, because of the wins they have. Something else, Dan, we should talk about with Georgia is safety Jake Pope, who uh, <laughs> decided to to uh, after the game uh, during the field rush uh, dance with his old Miss family members, uh, a, a, uh, a dance that was, um, in celebration after the game that was caught on video and Kirby Smart was asked about it earlier today. What an idiot. He said, <laughs> <laughs> a lot going on at Georgia these days. Yeah. I understand, you know, working on this podcast, I understand Kirby's frustration at times with, uh, the others. Um, <laughs> no, um, there we go. yeah, J- Jake, Jake Pope, uh, not good. He he explained that it was family friends of his who were there rooting for Ole Miss. He, he says, uh, I was trying to leave the field to safety, and they were extre- extremely excited to see me after the game. It was unexpected. I was also surprised to see them as, as well, and that's why you saw the reaction I gave in the video. If you look at it, there's these two people dressed in old Miss fans and he's jumping around amidst the celebration. And it looks like he's celebrating the old Miss victory while wearing a Georgia shirt. <laughs> they're Georgia also, uniform, uniform. Yeah, uniform, they uniform, also very, yeah. they're very close to my former teammate, longtime friend on the old Miss team, which is why they had those jerseys on. I am Georgia thick and thin and have never loved a group of guys more than the guys I go to battle with every day. So he apologized. Uh, go dogs. Uh, he said in his apology, uh, do you believe this statement? I, it is a uh, odd video. I, I, I will say I, I, I actually, I find the statement believable, but I still find the emotion a little questionable. Yeah. And I would say for a guy who's like a backup, who's appeared in three games, he may have just volunteered himself to go into the portal. <laughs> like Kirby at the end of the season may yeah. say, you know what? You want to cheer for Ole Miss? Go play for Ole Miss. Get out. Yeah. It wouldn't shock me. Wasn't a wasn't a good business decision. No, no. And you uh I get it, right? Like you have family and maybe you haven't seen them in a while or something. And um I, I get I understand all that, but yeah, you gotta kinda realize like where you are. Um, right. <laughs> and everybody's got everybody's in the media these days, right? Everybody's got a phone and video and and access to social media to post things and, and publish them for all to see. Yeah. So got to be a little smarter there, Mr. Pope. Yeah. There was also um, like, also like who are these family friends? I mean, the guy just lost a game. Don't you, when you see people after a game, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little commiseration. Don't right? you just like not jump. Hey man, great seeing you. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Dude, I just yeah. lost. I just like, say, hey, hey, Jake. Yeah, sorry about the game. I mean, I get yeah. it was a, it was chaotic in there. It was, it was all that. It's, it was uh, also on that old Miss field was Deuce Knight, the uh, quarterback from Loosedale, Mississippi, who was previously uh, committed to Notre Dame and then flipped to Auburn. He was out on the field uh, <laughs> with the when the goalpost came down so he was spotted I, you know obviously well, that, that should make you freeze feel great yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean these guys all take their visits and stuff but it was like uh-oh it's like who's that oh that's deuce knight oops uh he definitely was enjoying his visit according to the video i saw yeah weird times with the with the dogs i i, I just don't know um I, there's part of it is do you get in? Obviously, look, they beat Tennessee, they beat Georgia, they're Georgia Tech. Yeah, uh, this is a great resume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you don't, just seeing this thing kind of weaken, and uh, this isn't this isn't the Georgia juggernaut of the last three years. Because remember, they didn't lose until they lose the SEC championship game last year, right? You know, it's the three straight years, they're just dominant. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, you lose that. Then it's like, okay, you lose to Alabama. All right, well, you always lose to Alabama. That that was a 
That was the thing. Now the spread opened at 10 and a half. Georgia giving 10 and a half. I saw that number. Might have opened higher. Wow. It's now nine. Crazy. It's been bet yeah. down to nine. Still high. I think a lot that that could fluctuate depending on what everybody's saying about Nico. Nico's injury. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I saw that. Um, well, it's only going to get Heupel. lower if Nico's playing. And, and right. Josh he- right. Heupel said he was. It's yeah. Very good. Josh Heupel acted good. like he would. Yeah. On Monday morning. It seemed to suggest that he would play. Yeah. But th- that is a that that line is a testament to the idea that Kirby's going to absolutely. I mean, what a what a week of practice this must be. Yeah. <laughs> Jake Pope was not smiling now. And no, neither is the rest of them. <laughs> hmm. No. No, so this is this is a gut check for the bulldog program, and we haven't had one in a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, who are you? Tuesday, Tuesday practices are always the just blood and guts ones at Georgia, and I would bet this Tuesday is going to be a smash mouther. Uh, yeah, last time we saw Georgia, I think lose two regular season games was maybe twenty twenty uh, when they had the all SEC schedule, um, and then the last time, of course, they lost to a team not named Alabama was um was that year as well i think so they got going three years or three and a half years so it's pretty shocking to see them in this position um but yeah they they're failing to control the line of scrimmage and they're turning the ball over at quarterback uh but it is crazy the f- and i don't know what it says about texas right that georgia was able to handle texas as they did and in texas doesn't have a top 25 win right now by the way, so that's another whole conversation. But uh, but it's interesting what George has lost to Ole Miss and how they've looked maybe means for some of the other wins that uh, uh, George has had. All right, so on the flip, here comes Tennessee. And uh, it has not always been pretty this year. It was very pretty when they beat Alabama. But uh, they are 7-1, uh, and one. no, 8-1, 7-1, no, 7-1, 3-2. Th- no, eight and one. What are they? They're eight and one. <laughs> <laughs> They're eight, eight and one. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't that many weeks left. They're going to link them. A I didn't want to give them an extra left. win. They're eight yeah. and one. Three to go. <laughs> they have the great win against Alabama. Everything else, you know, NC State win didn't turn out quite what you maybe you had hoped. Oklahoma was a rock fight. They aren't any good. Florida went to overtime. Kentucky was really close. They kind of needed an injury to Kentucky, Kentucky's quarterback. Mississippi State wasn't, you know, it was fine. Arkansas, they lost. Tough loss at Arkansas was kind of falling apart. That said, they're eight and one. They won them all. So this is a check for Tennessee. Now you go into Georgia and win. If you're if you have Josh Heupel gets Alabama and Georgia in the same year, who baby? They're gonna name a street after him up there. This defense is ferocious. The running game is good. The passing game has been up and down, but there's a lot there, and this is a huge opportunity for for them. I wonder where they stand. Is that they would finish with UTEP and then at Vanderbilt? At 10 and 2, we've talked about this possibility of an eight way tie in the SEC at 6 and 2 in the league. But at 10 and 2, do they have enough to get into the playoff with one victory over Alabama and everything else? I would say probably, but I would rather beat Georgia if I'm Tennessee. Yeah, I think if you beat Georgia, you're almost in. Well, I mean, you would have to do something. You're also almost in disastrous. the SEC title game. Yeah. Yes. Right. Exactly. I mean, you are you are just inches away from everything you want. Um, you, you'd have to, you know, step on it against uh, Vanderbilt at the end, and Vanderbilt's better, but still, that would be that would be a surprise. Um, the funny thing, yeah, like you know, Josh Heupel was Mister Offense, Mister Tempo, Mister Razzmatazz, and. They went three straight games not scoring a point in the first half. Arkansas, Florida, Alabama. That Alabama game, they were down 7 nothing at halftime, and they looked hopeless. They got it together in the second half, and then after that, yeah, they did just enough against Kentucky and Mississippi State. But this has been defense first. Tim Banks, defensive coordinator, has got to be on the short list of for the Broyles Award for top assistant coach. And 
probably head coaching positions. Um, just done an excellent job with uh, the defense this year. And they're finding ways to win. They're running the ball, as you said, well. And Nico's been up and down. He's been in and out. But he makes some great, great plays. He can. He's got a fantastic arm. He's got good speed. Uh, so they're a dangerous team. They have not beaten Georgia since Kirby Smart's first year, 2016, and they haven't come close. None of the games have even been close. Georgia has owned them, and that's another reason this is a measuring stick game for both of them because Tennessee has gotten punked by Georgia. Georgia has done the punking. If Georgia steps back far enough to lose a third game and not beat Tennessee and Tennessee rises up to win, ooh, baby. Yeah, it feels like the uh, if that does happen, it does – you know, I know it's just one game, but um, that would obviously probably you know knock Georgia out right of the of the playoff. And for Georgia to not make a right a twelve team playoff, I think everybody would be pretty shocked about that. Uh, and it it just it would feel like again, it's just a single game, but it would feel like the the dynasty type of mentality in in perception of, of Georgia uh, would be shifting toward. Tennessee, given what they've they've done now in the last three years or so, if if they would win this game, um, so it it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel in a way to me, it doesn't feel quite as significant like as the Ole Miss game did as far as for Ole Miss, but uh, for Tennessee, it you know it, it's a it's a big one, and their defense has been incredibly well. Um, I mean, statistically, they're like outside of Texas, and Texas and them are pretty much head to head. I mean, they're they're both the top in the SEC defensively, and they're average, you know, allowing like 270 yards, 260 yards a game. Uh, it, it's been they've kind of their defense has risen up when when the offense has had struggles, and when uh, you have a young quarterback uh, like Nico, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have you're gonna have struggles. And uh, I think the defense has risen up and and been able to be a huge part of. You know, I mean, no, no, no team this year that they've played, no opponent has scored twenty points. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, they're they're fierce, and I think Tennessee, maybe unlike Ole Miss, needed to prove it a little more. Tennessee feels like it's it's there, it's back to being good. Can it take that next step? Well, here's a chance to take that next step. Right, if you get through this, you get through Vandy, you're going back to Atlanta. Beating Georgia matters a great deal for Tennessee in recruiting. Uh, they were at their best when they're getting kids out of those out of Atlanta and the north suburbs of Atlanta, which are only two and a half, you know, three hours, two and a half, two fifteen to campus. That's that's just that that's not that much further than going all the way to Nashville or whatever. From where they're at, it's a huge area for them. And if they're beating Georgia and then getting back to an SEC title game, that I, I know recruiting has changed, but it pays dividends. I just feel like they they have it. Do they want to take that next step? Can they take that next step? This would just be a, a, a massive opportunity um, for the Vols. So there's a lot riding on this game, uh, and and uh, there's a there's an SEC dynasty uh, in in the balance, kind of hanging in the balance that we haven't seen in a while. One other game I wanted to get to I thought was pretty interesting. Obviously, we'll pick all these games later in the week. Is uh, not ranked, but it's two Big Ten teams that entered this season with some pretty good expectations. And there's still a question whether uh, they can get bowl eligible. Uh, it, the, the, the floor has fallen out for Nebraska and USC. Nebraska is visiting USC on Saturday. Nebraska has lost three in a row. They are five and four. They got at USC. Then they have Wisconsin and at Iowa. Uh, it's not out of the question they lose their final six. If they can't beat USC. Um, certainly, they're not going to be. You know, we'll, I don't know what you make out of out of uh, out of Wisconsin at this point, but I don't know what you make out of out of Nebraska. Um, and then. You have uh, USC, which is four and five. They need two wins. And they've got Nebraska coming. They're at UCLA. We talked a ton about last week and on the last show about uh, what Deshaun Foster's got them pumping a little bit and a little momentum there. And they got Notre Dame at the end of the year. They got to win two of those three. Not even making a bowl for either of these teams would be 
that's a that's a tough season. I mean, that is a tough season at both places, Pat. Sure is. I mean, Nebraska hadn't made a bowl in a hundred years, and but this season, I think I even said it on the podcast at the beginning of the year. If they don't make a bowl, just bulldoze the stadium because it just seemed impossible for them to miss this year. Second year with Matt Rule, Dylan Rayola comes in, and you know the the promise was all there with him, and they'd added some other parts, but. After getting that five and one start, uh, it was five and two. I don't remember, but anyway, they they have really fallen off. They've averaged fourteen and a half points over their last four games, which is why they demoted Marcus Satterfield, their offensive coordinator, and they're bringing in Holgo, Dana Holgerson, the uh, thin-haired mullet man who was the head coach at a couple of different at Houston and West Virginia, <laughs> and uh, is one of the classic, you know, Mike Leach. Kind of let it all hang loose, offensive genius guys. And he's now coming in to take the reins of the offense, which just smacks of desperation to me. <laughs> they hired him last week. This week, he's the offensive coordinator. Okay, cool. Mid season um, change. What was the nickname you just gave him? Thinning haired uh, mullet? Was thinning, that it? Thinning, thinning haired thinning. mullet man. Yeah. Print the thinning shirts, hair. Dan. Print the yeah. shirts. <laughs> well, Gundy is sitting there going, hey, man, my locks are thick. That's yeah, a he's got. He's <laughs> yes. not thin-haired. Yeah, no. that's true. Gundy's never. Gundy wins all mullet competitions because yeah. it's it's full. But uh, Dana, it's going, going, almost gone. But he's not. He's not giving up. So <laughs> mullet. Uh, anyway, it's got. I mean, him with Rayola, and we'll see. Rayola apparently allegedly hurt his back, but I think they're expecting him back this week. But the offense has just kind of gone south there. After getting to the point of going to a bowl, this is the exact same thing they did last year. It fell apart at the end of the season and ended up with five wins. But then USC has had their own desperation panic button where they benched Miller Moss, which I think guarantees he's going to transfer. It certainly invites him to transfer. Uh, and they're going with Jade Maiava, who was really good last year as a freshman at UNLV. And we'll see if he can spark them. But again, Desperate times, desperate measures here to see if they can pull something out of these last three games. And both coaches may be tacitly, too, trying to point a finger at someone other than themselves for the struggles of their teams. Gosh, I, you know, Nebraska was uh, a team that I thought would uh, not just be, be in a bowl game, right, but that would be competing for a playoff spot, actually. They felt like the dark horse type of uh, program and, and uh, year two under Matt Rule, and he's had really good year twos where wherever he's been uh, in these rebuilding efforts and the black shirts and the defense seem to be back. And I think Indiana broke them. You know, it, it was, uh, t yeah, they, they had a bye week going to that game. They were five and one and there was real, I was talking to some people within the Nebraska program before the game against the Hoosiers. And there were, there was real optimism um, that they could, that they would win that game. And, uh, not only did they not win it, but they lost 56 to 7. Um, and they just haven't really been the same. I mean, they played well against Ohio State, uh, right? And then, but then they lost to UCLA and uh, seven years, seven years without, I believe, seven years without a bowl game. Um, back to 2016 when Mike Riley was the coach. And they just can't seem to get over that. Uh, that hump and they've been at that five and seven mark a couple times, you know, over the course of that and just couldn't get that extra, the, the extra win, you know, USC, um, maybe Minnesota broke them. I may mean, go back to that game against Minnesota where they had the lead in the fourth quarter and, and couldn't hold it. Um, and Minnesota scored on the goal line to win the game. And, you know, of course, USC story of their year, right. Has been that they just couldn't hold the lead. I think, each game, five games, they had a lead in the fourth quarter that they that they blew. Um, so, yeah, and if, at Nebraska, you're you're pointing the finger at the offense and, and the play calling, like they obviously have. And at USC, you're you're pointing the the, uh, the finger at the defense. Um, and the way these two teams started the year, remember USC beat LSU, got off to a two and zero start, and Nebraska was three and zero, and it just Colorado. felt like these were two potential playoff teams, you know. Yeah, and th this could end badly for both. Like really disappointing season. So there's some misery on at stake. There's some misery at stake yeah. out there. Oh yeah, we like misery. <laughs> it is blame season. 
I think Mike Norvell it is. fired the offensive coordinator, <laughs> defensive coordinator, and wide receiver coach this week after fifty-two <laughs> yeah. three yeah. at Notre Dame. Eight point five million yep. in buyouts just for those three. Just for those three. And Norvell himself is a whole lot more than that. But next year, brother, they'll find it if he doesn't do better. Yeah, That's, it's, he's hunting for coaches. So, uh, yeah, everyone's got it going. All right, we'll be back right after this message. It's time for some money moves presented by Invesco QQQ, the official ETF of the NCAA. And uh, this one is uh, interesting, very interesting. Our money moves this week. Diego Pavia, the Vanderbilt quarterback, has sued the NCAA, sued the NCAA uh, about la late last week, arguing that the bylaws of the organization that count junior college seasons against NCAA eligible seasons is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act because it is cutting two years off of his ability and other players like him to earn, uh, engage in trade, if you will. Pavia, he was basically a high school wrestler. Wrestled at 160 pounds. He was very good in New Mexico. Uh, he did not have any FBS or FCS offers coming out of high school. So he went, he did have a couple of D2, some D2 interests, but he spent two years at New Mexico Military Institute a junior college that plays in the illustrious Southwest Junior College Football Conference. Some bus rides in that thing. <laughs> Became a quarterback prospect. He then went last year, played at New Mexico State. Now he has transferred to Vanderbilt. So he's played two years of FBS football. However, due to the NCAA's rules, his two seasons at junior college also count as seasons of college eligibility. Now, the argument here is that the junior college is uh, under the auspices of the NJCAA, the National Junior College Athletic Association, has no affiliation with the NCAA. And so the NCAA bylaw isn't fair. And it argued, I read the whole lawsuit, it said that... Uh, these eligibility restrictions are, quote, not placed on athletes who choose to delay entry into the NCAA one college, NCAA college sports to attend prep school, serve in the military, or even to compete professionally in another sport. Remember, we've seen guys like famously Chris Wenke play base pro baseball for five years and then come back and have the full allotment of eligibility to play college football and eventually do that at Florida State and then go to the NFL. So you can play multiple sports. Uh, and it says the bylaws aren't fair because it literally, they, the bylaws in their state that the moment you enroll full-time in any academic institution, even if it isn't affiliated with the NCA, your clock starts on your five years that you have to play to use your four years of eligibility, right? So you have four years of eligibility. You have five years to do it. You can take a red shirt year. So you could enroll at your local junior college and not play sports for two years, then transfer to a NCA school uh, after earning an associate's degree, and you would only have three years of eligibility left if you then decide to play sports. So even if you didn't play at the JUCO, you'd lose a year. So all of this uh, gets into it. We'll stop there. I have some other thoughts on this, but what do you think? Justice 40, People's Court. Uh, well, I will say, and I'll give you credit, Dan Wetzel, you've been saying for months that you were waiting for somebody to to push push the unending or endless eligibility in court. And this is at least a precursor to that. And uh, it is interesting, the argument there, when you lay it out, you know, I, I am certain Diego Pavia and everyone else who goes to JUCO goes in with a knowledge and understanding that, yeah, okay, after this, I'm going to get two years and, uh, or three actually, cause he played two at New Mexico state now one at, at Vandy, but, uh, that, you know, that's, that's the rule. That's the understanding. That's the clock. I don't know whether you, I guess you can go back and try to retroactively unwind the clock or stop it. And then, uh, 
start it over, so to speak. I will be interested to see, yes, how well this is received. And then if it inspires anybody else to try to uh, take advantage of the potential of, of an endless college football career. So Lord you're, knows we you're got right. Enough he old played two now. years at New Mexico State and one at Vandy. Yeah. There's a COVID year yeah. at New Mexico military. We're throwing that in there. Believe me, there's some there's some arcane stuff in this lawsuit. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, my God, no. Um, but, yes, I did get that wrong. Two years at New Mexico State. He got five years of eligibility because his first year at New Mexico military was a COVID year, 2020. Go ahead, Ross. I'm just wondering if there's any NCAA rule safe from legal challenges. I'm starting <laughs> no. to think no, there's not. <laughs> there's, there are no NCAA rules that are, that are safe, which is probably why many of them are in the process of uh, being changed to align with the settlement. By the way, Speaking of the the unending uh, career, college careers that Pat just mentioned and Dan has talked about before, that's in the settlement, right, that that a college athlete can't play. I'm pretty sure it's in the settlement. So the settlement is supposed to protect the house settlement, a the duration of eligibility. Um, again, the settlement's supposed to protect a lot of things, and we'll see if that happens. Uh, but this is actually really a fascinating one and um, because it's not right it's not arguing for uh, a complete you know abolishment of the eligibility rules it's just arguing for the junior college rules or junior college not to count and yeah you you know you talk to lawyers um who've read this and and you know a couple of them will tell you that oh, this is it's kind of got some good arguments in there, you know no 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 NSA rule is 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 safe and uh and you know, the, the, um, I don't know how this, I don't know how this ends because I can't imagine the NCAA changing its rules to, uh, permit junior college players to get full five years eligibility. Cause guess what happens then you have thousands of kids filing class action lawsuits for back pay, probably just like the house case from NIL lost that they could have had if these rules were in place. So I, I'm curious to, yeah, to follow this one should be, yeah, should it, be it's, interesting. It's, so what I've said all along is when does somebody say, why is there only four years of eligibility? I have the right to make a living. I have uh, teams and schools and boosters that want to pay me to make a living, what is this arbitrary four-year thing? Um, I fully believe the NCAA should have the right to say, this is it, you got five years to do four or four, or that you only get five or whatever. The NCAA needs that protection to be able to establish. We do not need, I think we said, like Sam Hartman co you know, playing quarterback until he's 38 years old. <laughs> yeah, right. With that, those, those great locks still like, you know, mm -hmm. we don't need him around the freshman <laughs> The ladies it'd just be creepy the whole thing no i mean but good guys would be playing forever and because it's yeah. just and we don't need that is that's not what we need we already got it long no. enough yeah well so you gotta get out of there yeah and and dan the the incentive to not continue to play college athletics was always well you're not getting paid but right. now you're like, yeah you're but about you to could, get paid you're gonna get paid right so now why not? But you would also, even if you just did the NIL, like these guys are getting, you just, if you could stay eligible in grad school and basically just every year stay, yeah. keep getting more and more grad degrees. Yeah. You know, we would have very learned football pro teams. <laughs> yes, that's right. Like I'm working on my, multiple you know, degrees, my, right, yeah, European degree. poetry yeah. masters, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> just yeah. everyone would be very, very learned, uh, <laughs> but totally ridiculous. This, though, is different, and that's what I, I I'm 100 percent opposed to that. That would just be a farce. So I, there's yeah. actually stuff that they didn't mention in the lawsuit that I think uh, I'm going to give you them some free legal uh, ideas here on this case. So I agree with this bit. Why should the NCA? Why? Why does the NCA get to say what matters at the NJCAA? And here's where they get. In, this is where I think the NCA's got some issues. And I'll go back to hockey. And I know I mentioned hockey rules all the time, but hockey has the best rules because no one was paying attention because nobody cares. <laughs> so the hockey people just go, hey, what do you think of this? Makes common sense. Do it. 
And then in football, men's basketball, they have, I, I bet the hockey rules manual is like a page. <laughs> Can you skate? Yes. <laughs> Give him a stick. <laughs> can you can you <laughs> speak Canadian English? Is you can be enough? drafted by yeah. the Toronto Maple Leafs. Okay, you can be the number yeah. one draft pick in the NHL draft and go play. Co- then go play college. All right, you can do anything, and uh, hockey doesn't care. But in hockey, many of the plus prospects that play college hockey go through a thing called the United States Hockey League. Which, when you're about 16 years old, if you're a great co- a high school hockey player, you're or whatever you are, you wouldn't even be playing high school. You go to the United States Hockey League, which is a bunch of teams in basically Iowa and a little bit of Nebraska and stuff like that. It is an incredible league, and these small towns in Iowa love it. Um, you will get NHL prospects. Everybody's coming through there. They're 16, 17, 18, and you can play until you're 21 years old. And that is where the majority the majority of those kids then go on to the NCA. There is an educational component to the USHL, including kids taking online college classes, community college classes. They don't they aren't playing for their junior college, but they are taking college classes. They're 21 there's kids 21 years old in the league. Then they go to play college hockey. They are not stripped of a year of eligibility. Now, I believe just Monday, the NCAA just allowed the same deal with the Canadian junior col- uh, junior leagues, including the OHL, the Ontario Hockey League, where they pay the players a stipend as well as they sit around from 16 to 21. College hockey is about to get flooded with incredible talent. So you have professional players playing hockey, and this is high, high high-level stuff, the OHL. And you are getting paid and playing, and you're 19, 20, 21, and you don't lose any eligibility, but Diego Pavia does at the New Mexico Military Institute? (laughs) Or one of these last... We saw Last Chance You, man. That wasn't wasn't too glamorous down there. East Mississippi. (laughs) East East Mississippi. It's the one in Kansas, Scuba. the one in Kansas. Scuba. 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 Here's another. And Pat, you can help me with the swimming, but the gym, the gymnasts. Okay. The gymnasts can delay entry into college, uh, like the U.S. Olympic gymnastics team, or in the case sometimes, including I think this year, at least one of them. They're a little old this year, maybe last time. You can play two years of I don't know, you play gymnastics, but you compete two years in college gymnastics. You'd be at LSU or Auburn. You could be SUNY Lee at Auburn. And then you could take a year off and train for the Olympics and the World Championships, which is a higher level of competition, the, the highest level of competition, and then come back and still have your eligibility. You don't lose that year. And you can be making NIL money and you can be training at the highest level and go to the Olympics and then come back and still have your two years of eligibility. And I would imagine it's similar for swimming. You could take a break in a swimming year and just train and focus on right the swimming and uh, uh, probably other winter sports and gap, stuff. Gap years for the Olympics very, are common, yes. Gap if you got year, a chance to make the Olympics. They're team, still yeah. taking classes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I'm fine with that, but that seems to be a real problem if you're arguing this matters because it's junior college football, but this doesn't matter because it's hockey, gymnastics, swimming, yeah. and other sports that we don't really care about. <laughs> right. No, that's 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 an interesting point, you know. Uh Diego might he might have a good argument here. Yeah, by the way, the uh New Mexico Military Institute has both junior college and high school sports, both. <laughs> Okay. I don't know how, how does that work? but you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> they got it listed uh, the on their website. I'm looking at it now. Let's well, you it. just yeah, just gave yourself the, an assignment. The pod yeah. investigates. <laughs> don't ask a question you don't want to look up. There I don't know. Go. I don't know what's and, the New Mexico Military Institute. I mean, I think Diego's yeah. got a case here. I, yeah, but I don't think that you have a case if you want to sit there and have uh keep getting grad degrees. But we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh spoke very clearly. 
Mm. He sure did. Very, very clearly. So uh, that uh, that's that's our bit. So that is our uh, money moves from Invesco QQQ, the official ETF of the NCAA. Guess what the home stadium of New Mexico Military Institute is called? What is it? The Wool Bowl. Like W-O-O-L? Yes, like sheep stuff. You know? <laughs> I think all three uh, of us would pronounce that there. word differently. Yeah. <laughs> wool? I, I wool. say wool. 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 I don't, <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know. Yep. All right. The Wool Bowl. Pl- played Blinn College there and... Uh, not many home games. How many, Northeast uh, Oklahoma A and M. That's coming up. Yeah, I think the I think the uh, U.S. Hockey League's got it better. You know, people criticize uh, college basketball for their like starting their season and no one noticing it. <laughs> uh, not this year. I want to commend a couple programs for making sure you reminded us that the college basketball season has started. Auburn Tigers step up. First time I've ever heard of a team flight. They were flying to a game at Houston last Friday night, I think. Whatever it was. Playing Saturday. Thursday, they were in flight and had to turn the plane around. It's like your dad. I'm going to turn. Don't make me turn this car around. But that's right. Bruce Pearl was up there. And the pilot. Uh, of course, you know, this is FAA stuff. Like Auburn can, can get a lot of stuff out of the uh, Open Records Act, but they cannot stop the FAA <laughs> communication. <laughs> Try sending a Freedom of Information Act to Auburn. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, I think I got I a have. couple 15 years they've been sitting there. I'll get to it next month. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. um, uh, quote from the pilot, we have a bunch of basketball players fighting. <laughs> uh, so the plane came back. Uh Freshman guard, uh, the two guys, we don't know whether they were the fighters, but they they were left behind and the team returned later to Houston. Uh, Auburn hasn't said much. Bruce Pearl hasn't said much other than say it was a unfortunate situation. Uh, we yeah. did get a, a classic statement from the Auburn Police Department, one of my all-time favorites here. Uh, said didn't say a whole lot, but did say the altercation occurred in airspace not in the jurisdiction of the Auburn Police Department. <laughs> <laughs> so whose jurisdiction is it 30,000 feet up? Do we know? God. Well, it's God. The U.S. military? <laughs> it's God's the U- jurisdiction. The U.S. military? Uh, I have no idea. Oh, not yeah. the U.S. Yes. military. It's exactly I guess the, the US jurisdiction Force, Auburn right? wants it to be, which is nobody's. <laughs> they should have offered Cam Newton that money on a plane. Then that's the trick. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Yeah, allegedly, not at the Hilton Garden Inn. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, did you guys see before they took off? Uh, you know, one of the one of the, <laughs> one of the basketball players took a selfie, and I mean, this is a, obviously it's a private jet, you know, and it's like a 10, 12 seater. I mean, if if a brawl gets really <laughs> intense no. in a twelve seat private jet, you're not Terrifying. just talking about like trouble inside. You're, you're, and this reminds me of like the, uh, you know, the Seinfeld episode, the, the final episode where Kramer's bouncing around in the private jet trying to get water out of his ear. And they're like, don't do that. We'll die. <laughs> like, you, 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 this could have easily been really bad. Um, cause private jets, yeah. I mean, it's not, yeah. uh, it's not good. Not good. Not no, good. don't do that. Uh, <laughs> classic though, the classic ending Auburn uh, won the game 74 uh, 69. So. There you go. Of course. Nobody probably knows how to coach their way through more chaos <laughs> than Bruce Pearl. Well, maybe a couple people. Bruce Calipari Pearl's like, yeah, whatever. We'll do it. Yeah. That. Unfortunate situation. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I love it, Dan. You really you have the strategy. I mean, if, if, there, if there were still NCAA rules, the way around it, take all your recruits up in a plane and pay them there. Yeah. Because you got no, there's no jurisdiction in the air. Right. I think like Nevin Shapiro used to try to get the guys out on his boat, get out into on international the waters. Ah, <laughs> oh, there you go. Right? Yeah. Perfect. Try catching me there, NCAA. <laughs> you don't own these waters. Uh, and then I don't, this is not a laughing matter, so I don't. I should have gone no. the other route, but Florida basketball coach Todd Golden is facing allegations. A Title IX complaint of uh, stalking, 
photo, taking photos of co-eds on campus, messaging them through direct messages. Uh, the behavior is absolutely uh, creepy. A great job by Jack Meyer and Max Tucker of The Alligator, the student newspaper, uncovered this story. I don't know what this guy was thinking, but uh, we got that. But he's still coaching, of course. So Yeah, that, I mean, Monday night, coaching uh, Florida played... Uh, who they play? Grambling, they play, I think. Uh, Grambling. I, I mean, it's. I don't even know what. I guess they got to let this play out. But um, yeah, it's uh, Ryan, be a it's hell Todd of Ryan a investigation, I, right? I don't. This story doesn't reek. This reads as like five alarm fire here. I don't know how you got all these different women to come up with all this proof. Mm. I, there's photos yeah, it, of things. Yeah, yeah, not good. It's a, no, it's a troubling one for yeah. sure. And this all flared up in february last year and it was a front burner thing for a while and many people including sports illustrated inquired with florida about it and florida came back and said that they had no evidence of anything uh bad and it was at a point where they there were there was a lot of talk but there were no names there was no specifics. Uh, you know, it was just very hard to pursue and get anything. And then now there was a Title IX complaint, and the the alligator got it and turned it into a, a pretty major story, obviously. So it's a it's a serious situation that was percolating back there. But Florida's actions indicate that they really believe Todd Golden isn't who he's portrayed to be in this because they didn't do anything last February. Then they extended him. Then they are standing by him while all this is going on. So, whoo, two sides to the story, I guess. But we'll hear we'll hear what their side is eventually, and uh, then we'll learn something. Yeah, yeah. That I was about to mention, like the the fact that Florida's actions are or non non actions uh, kind of tell you that um, they they are satisfied with whatever you know, investigation that uh, they did in looking into this issue that Pat has said, yeah, I think I remember here bubbling, hearing it about it bubbling up in, in March and, uh, and then, uh, then it kind of resurfaced last week, a little bit bubbled up. And I was told then, you know, before the story dropped, kind of got messages like probably Pat did too, of, um, clearly, you know, it seems that Florida is, uh, at least so far, hasn't found anything to corroborate the complaint. Uh, but the complaint is damning, it seems. And uh, yeah, great job with the student newspaper to to get a hold of it. Yeah, no, the story is 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 very damning. So we'll see. Uh, innocent until proven guilty, but Title IX thing on that. So there's basketball for you. All right, we'll be back after this. All right. Uh, couple stories here one is uh we have a new sport potentially for the nca oh, no. new sport mm. you heard about this thing chess boxing what? <laughs> chess boxing combines chess and boxing as you might have okay. guessed surprisingly uh they're playing it in russia the russians are just of course that sounds yeah, really it like sounds very russian. russian it does sound <laughs> russian yeah. yeah so uh you get in there with your opponent and uh, you put a table down in the middle of a boxing ring and you play three minutes of chess, uh, like fast paced chess. And uh, after three minutes, the bell rings. And uh, if neither t- guy is, you know, if there's the game is still going on, they fold up the table, put on the boxing gloves, and then you fight one round of boxing. And then if that survives, you then go back and play another three minute round of chess and it keeps what? going until. Yeah. So you can either, che- you can what? either checkmate your opponent or you can knock them out. Knock them out. <laughs> so what, well, I, this is, yeah, I'm, this is I'm looking at, I'm looking at images of this, the, yeah, the chess. Real. Yeah. The chess board is popped up in the middle of the boxing ring. Yeah. Yeah. Chess boxing. So they what say the, the real interesting part is when the strategy is if you're in an advantageous situation in the game of chess, then you you don't want to really risk 
you get on your horse and run around the ring, get away from the guy. <laughs> right. But if you're down, you got to go for the KO because you're about to get you're about to get uh, checkmated. So there's there's some real strategy here. Uh, brains mm. and brawn all in one sport. Ross, is this the next sitting... NCA sport? Are they going to add it? They could add women and men. You know, do you want Title IX compliant? No, no. Surely they wouldn't add this. This is weird. <laughs> I mean, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Have you seen They're some of these sports the table. Ivy League plays? They're just as <laughs> dumb. Well, I, I well, this first of all, bizarre. got a lot of questions. Here. Okay, go ahead, Pat. Let, do you? I mean, you gotta. You cannot play chess with boxing gloves take on. The boxing well, gloves so you take the boxing gloves off. You take them off. I mean, yeah, but then, apparently. I mean, you get the, your hands taped up. And yeah, the hands, be are very the hands are taped. Cumbersome mm -hmm. process. Yeah. It is. It's a it cumbersome is. process. You know, moving the chess pieces around, then lacing them up and going and pounding somebody. Then you take them back off, and then you move knight to mm -hmm. rook four, or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I it's it seems like uh, like a, an inefficient combination of sports. Yeah. For one thing. Like, if yeah. you want to do it as a biathlon sort of thing, fine. Play the chess match, somebody wins, and then go beat the hell out of each other, and somebody wins. And maybe the same person wins twice. The biathlon, they they do cross-country skiing, then they stop and shoot at well, targets. That, that's true. So it, And then they true. ski some more. It's about getting your heart okay. rate down. That's a pretty yeah. crazy sport. Yeah, I... I'm, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm failing. Just this is like they they dream this up in Siberia yeah. when it's just too damn cold to do anything else. You know? I thought you it's were like... lying at first. <laughs> I thought you were this trying to a, pull a fast this is one a, on us. If rich white kids can side door their way into Yale, this is going to become a thing. <laughs> if it's it. one more opportunity, you watch uh, chess boxing. Uh, <laughs> I like chess like, and I like the violence of boxing, so I'm good with it. <laughs> Uh, it's. Uh, I hope nobody uses the chess cheating tactics. Oh, yeah, that's a good uh, point. Yeah. You know what I suggest? Right. Let's 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 combine. Uh, instead of chess and boxing, let's combine um, poker and football, Dan. So have oh. have uh, everybody. Well, poker you know, an individual sport and play a little. Okay. Well, spades. Poker. How about that? Team, team <laughs> spades games. And you know you're you're in the middle of a game. You two stop. On two basketball. Yeah, you just start playing. You just start running into each other on a football field with a helmet. I don't. Uh, this is bizarre. I like it. I think you got to be creative. Think outside the box. Think outside the mm. box. These guys are just uh, sitting at the table in the ring, shirtless, with like boxing gloves yeah, by their like side. It's like just bleeding the most bizarre looking thing, man. What it's Russia, weird, man. It's what, Russia. What a, they got nothing. They got literally weird. nothing to do there. I was there. I was in Sochi, Russia. Nothing to do. There's nothing. They just get drunk all the time. I mean, really, I they have it. to find something better than this. <laughs> it's got to be something nah, they, better. They don't. They, they can create. They, they don't. I mean, they can't. Man. They have. No, mm. it's nothing. Uh, I mean, when I was like, uh, <laughs> when I was in college, when I was in college, we would play Trivial Pursuit and pool at the same time. Okay. You know, you'd like kind of move in between and stuff and, and drink at the same time. It's a lot that, of women at your fraternity, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. I mean, was, <laughs> this was six guys sitting around mm. doing that, watching MTV. That was it. Yeah, really pretty exciting. cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Finally, uh, last one. Uh, we can people's court this. Uh, Warsaw, Poland. We've been the Euro Europeans have been giving us a lot lately. Um, a funeral home in Poland issued an apology uh saturday after a corpse that it was transporting fell out of a hearse and into traffic <laughs> yeah police <laughs> police media polish media reported that a man was driving down a street friday in uh stalala St stalawa walla a city in mm. southeastern <laughs> per perfect. Walla. i don't know perfectly said i'm sure that was the pronunciation yeah. listen at least i'm not the dead guy <laughs> So this guy's driving down the street and a, a sheet comes flying at him like a, like a bed sheet and covers his car window. Oh, my God. Then the, he stopped. <laughs> and the than sheet a body, I guess. The sheet slid down and he saw oh, no. a body laying on the road. Oh, yeah. And he, he for a moment, the driver feared that he had hit the person. I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> That's true. That would be scary. Yeah. Uh, oh. In fact, so the corpse was lying in a pedestrian crossing too. So this guy was upset. Uh, the company transporting the the corpse. Uh, <laughs> Hades Funeral Service. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Issued a statement. <laughs> wow. We'll get you to hell faster than anybody else. <laughs> what yeah. is this? You named it Hades? H A D E S. Maybe that means something else in German. I don't. This is an AP story. I. Hey, <laughs> 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 Who would name their funeral service? I never Hades. liked that guy. Let's just send him to the Hades funeral service. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uncle what? Uncle Leo is kind of a jerk. <laughs> mm. What in the Send world? Send him to hell. Uh, they uh, blamed. They took responsibility for the incident. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good job, Hades who owners. Else, who else's fault would it be? It's not the dead yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. <laughs> he was just laying there, man, in the <laughs> sheet. Uh, they blamed a, quote, technical failure of the hearse. Hmm. Um. So, uh, it apologized to quote all those who are disappointed and upset by this event. Uh, end quote. <laughs> um. Mm-hmm. So, my question uh, to you guys is: uh, Let's say you're dead and you're in the hearse. <laughs> let's say you're dead. Okay. <laughs> you're the guy. You're the guy. Yeah. Do you want one last like pop out? <laughs> One last ray of sunshine to hit you. Absolutely. Especially in the middle of a road. Throw me out. I mean, it's going to hurt, but you're dead. So you're not feeling it. (laughs) But one more moment of like, (laughs) and then you make international news and a bunch of idiots on a college football podcast (laughs) talking about you. One more moment in the news, right? You're 15 minutes of fame. Identify this guy. Yeah. A dead guy in Poland is being talked about on a football podcast in America. I think that guy would appreciate that. I think he'd be yeah. like, yeah, whatever. I'm dead. I mean. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm dead. <laughs> that's going to be the pull quote. This, that's, yeah. 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 <laughs> Make sure you get that down, Joe. Yeah, whatever. I'm dead. I mean, yes. You get to literally <laughs> stop traffic one last yeah, time. one last pop out. A little fresh air. Yeah. little uh, sun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, you scared the hell out of this other guy. Might have to be closed casket after that, though, if you've been, you know, rolling around on the asphalt at a high level. I don't know anyone's speed. coming to this thing if they put you in the Hades funeral. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. What about this guy's family? Hopefully they didn't read it and they first heard from the Hades funeral home directors. By the uh, way, Uncle Joey slipped out of yeah. the... You know, whatever it's called. Our deep empathy towards the families of the deceased. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, that's this is a Larry David episode. Yeah, there, absolutely. I yeah. think Larry I'd David want out. Somehow I'd is... want out. Yeah. <laughs> Make a run for it, man. It's nothing. Once you get in it. that hearse, there's no going back. Yeah. Maybe there is. You don't know. <laughs> All right, that's our show. Uh, oh, definitely Lord. time to uh, end it. We'll be back Thursday with more games and more college sports talk and uh, who knows what else from here. No chess boxing. No chess boxing. (laughs) Thanks for listening and watching. Thanks again to Invesco QQQ, the official ETF of the NCAA.